Welcome to Lecture 12 of Statistical Rethinking 2023. In this lecture, I'm going to reveal to you that I've been leaving some information on the table for all the lectures previous to this. Let me explain. So last lecture, I ended with this uh, point that there are a couple of important variables causing a lot of variation in the um, trolley uh, moral judgment data. Uh, the stories themselves, there are 12 different ones, and um, participants tend to have different reactions to the details of these stories. Uh, and there are 331 individuals who participated in the experiment, and they um, each contributed only 30 responses. And they have very different response tendencies that are unexplained by other things we know about them. We could include these variables in the model using the uh, categorical uh, index variable trick I showed you very early on in the course. I think it was in the second week. Um, and that would work. Uh, but we could do better. And in fact, basically every example of categorical variables up to this point in the book, we could have done better. And this is an interesting example of a, a basic feature of scientific modeling is that for any given <coughs> S demand, there may be multiple estimators we could use. Um, they would all work in principle, but some are better than others. Uh, so let me show you what I mean by a better estimator. So here's the stories and the participants uh, from the data. And what I want you to appreciate about this is the variation uh, in each. So for the stories, what I'm showing you are the ranges of responses and the averages for each. And you'll see that stories vary a lot in the kinds of uh, uh, responses they receive. Remember the y-axis on these plots is the judgment of how appropriate the action in the story is. Uh, and on the right, uh, these are just the, the first 50 participants. There are 331, remember, in the whole study, but just the first 50 showing the same basic idea, the ranges of their responses, and then the uh, estimated average in the red circle. Uh, for people vary a lot in which numbers they use in these ranges. Uh, there's some people who judge everything one, for example. So other people who judge everything as four. Uh, we could include these index variables, just as I mentioned before. You know how to do this. So for example, for the story, um, for each story, and e uh, you just need to give it an index from one to 12. There are only 12 stories. And then you can make a vector of coefficients. And the example on the screen, we just call them beta. And then you use the story index um, for each response i to pull out the appropriate um, coefficient. And then this would adjust the average response so that some stories are on average more uh, appropriate to people and others less. Um, this will work. Uh, the information that's being left on the table, however, is that this model forgets everything it knows about how people respond as it moves from one story to the next. Uh, let me explain what I mean by that. There's this kind of amnesia called anterograde amnesia where people can't form new long-term memories. They learn fine in the short term, they can have conversations, uh, but as soon as they leave the room and come back in, they will have forgotten the conversation they just had. And the coefficients beta in the model on the screen here are like this. They come to one story, they learn about it, they get an estimate for it, they move to the next, it's a brand new beta. Uh, and they have, no, they have not updated their expectations at all about how appropriate the story should be or not. Now, maybe you think that's okay and this is the way you want your model to learn, but actually it's very inefficient uh, because while the stories are different, they're also alike. And the model starts out with some naive prior about um, the differences between the stories. And when it learns about one story, it should be updating that prior, and that'll help it learn about the others faster. I'm going to give you an extended example of this because I appreciate it's a little strange. Uh, so just hang on. <clears throat> We're going to make new kinds of models do, that do not exhibit anterograde amnesia. And these models are often called multi-level models. And they are because they are models within models. Um, so the first thing we do in these models is we model the observations that are me measured at group or individual levels, uh, like the responses in the trolley problem data. 
And at the same time, we have a model of the population of those groups in, or individuals as well. That is their average and their dispersion. And that submodel, the population model, creates a kind of memory because it allows us to transfer information from one group to another within the model uh, optimally, according to the rules of probability theory. And uh, all the models that don't have this, that don't have this population submodel, they can learn. They can learn fine, and they'll often end up with, with similar estimates. But they learn slower, and they leave information on the table, and they exhibit more overfitting. Uh, that's what we're going to talk about going forward. Uh, so two perspectives on why we want to use multi-level models. The first is this thing about memory. Uh, models that do not have enterogreen amnesia learn faster because they get to transfer what they learn from one context to the other within the data, the contexts being the subgroups in the data. Uh, and second, as a consequence of this, um, they resist overfitting better. Uh, both of these are valuable things, how quick they learn and the reduction of overfitting. So <clears throat> let's talk about the memory issue for a second. I'm going to have an extended example here where I show you uh, updated posterior distributions. And we're going to use a uh, maybe a relatable uh, idea. Uh, it seems like every place I go in Europe, uh, there are Starbucks coffees now. Uh, in some countries, that's an improvement. Uh, in other countries, it's not. But regardless, they're everywhere. And the thing about Starbucks is it's basically the same everywhere. Well, mostly. There are some differences. Uh, but say we had this uh, research project where we wanted to learn how long people uh, going to a Starbucks needed to wait for their coffee order. Um, and we wanted to design a, a golem, a robot, to do this for us, a little coffee robot, and it was going to learn optimally. How should we program it to work? Well, obviously, it's going to be Bayesian, because anything else would be silly. Um, and the other thing is you want it to... Uh, as it explores um, the, the different Starbucks in, say, Berlin, um, when it comes to a new Starbucks, it shouldn't forget everything it knew about the previous ones it's been to. It should have expectations about how long the waits will be and then update those with the new data. So let me walk you through this in, in uh, actual Bayesian updating. I'm going to show you some posterior distributions and show you how this works. And I'll show you how to build models like this to make these graphs uh, later on in the lecture. But for now, just, just focus on the narrative and the concepts. <clears throat> okay, what I'm showing you on the slide here is the idea that uh, the, the basic components of a multi-level model, we've got in blue there um, probability distribution for the waiting times in the population of cafes. Uh, say, pick your favorite European capital and think of it as that. And that is that most of the time it's less than five minutes, uh, but there's this long tail <clears throat> of possibilities for average waiting times. Um, and then I'm showing you the uh, um, posterior distribution for one cafe. We're just the first one. We'll just call it Cafe Alpha. And Cafe Alpha is is uh, uh, this is a prior. We haven't visited it yet, um, uh, but we expect it to be pretty fast. Uh, you can think of Cafe Alpha as being a draw from that population distribution of, of average waiting times. <clears throat> now our robot um, visits Cafe Alpha and it gets its coffee in about two minutes. And that's that vertical black line uh, um, in the plot with the red distribution there. And it uses that to update. And you, so you'll see that the gray curves are the previous posterior distributions. They're now prior distributions. And uh, uh, now the... Um, uh, red posterior distribution has updated to expect um, slightly longer times than it did before on average. But it's still quite vague, right? The robot hasn't had, had much data. It's just one data point. And this is a, a nice time to remind you that for Bayesian updating, the minimum sample size is one, right? There is no magic sample size. This is logical and, uh, and precise for any sample size, yeah? Um, Notice that the blue curve is also updated uh, because we've learned something about the population. And so what we had before was a prior. And now we have this idea that waiting times are, are closer to around five, but below it. Um, but it's still quite vague. And you're going to see this is going to get updated more and more as we visit more cafes. OK, so here's another one. Here's our second cafe, Cafe Beta. We have not visited it yet, but our robot's about to go there. And what I want you to see is that the prior for Cafe Beta looks like Cafe Alpha. Now, this is the memory part of it. 
It can use what it's learned about other cafes um, to uh, have better priors, and this will help it learn faster the correct waiting time <clears throat> to a greater level of precision uh, as it visits new cafes. So now, say it goes to Cafe Beta and it ends up waiting 17 minutes because Cafe Beta is in a very busy place with lots of tourists. Uh, and so the posterior distribution for that cafe is stretched to the right. Uh, and notice that the other two um, have also updated. So the posterior distribution for Cafe Alpha has also moved, which is necessary and logical because uh, the order that you visit these cafes cannot logically matter to what you believe about them if you're a Bayesian robot. <clears throat> uh, I'll say that again. The, the order you visit cannot matter. You've got to get the same posterior distributions whether you visit Cafe Beta first or Cafe Alpha first. And so necessarily the posterior distribution for Cafe Alpha also updates. And it does because the population <clears throat> model has also updated on the far left. We can visit Cafe Alpha again and we'll get more updating. Uh, we get a, basically the same waiting time. This time it's like three minutes. Uh, the robot's going increasingly confident that Cafe Alpha is pretty fast. Um, after three more visits, uh, a third visit to Cafe Alpha, uh, right around at four minutes, and you'll see that the posture distribution there is growing taller and narrower. Um, now let's add, we can add more and more cafes uh, down at the bottom. And then each of those before the robot has visited Gamma, Delta, or Omega, it's just a prior. It just looks like the population cafe, right? It's like you're drawing a, an expectation from the population of cafes. <clears throat> uh, but that's good because uh, then when it arrives at these new cafes, it's got a more informed prior. It's used the data um, from the other cafes to do it. But it also thinks that cafes vary, right? Because you'll see that the population distribution of cafes in the upper left, the blue curve, is not concentrated on a single value. What the robot here is learning is not that all cafes are alike, it's learning how different they are. So we can our robot visits each of these and gets a particular update, and every time it does, it updates mostly for that one, uh, but it also updates the others a little bit. Uh, and as time goes on, uh, the population model converges around a particular area using data from all of the different cafes um, and the blue uh, posterior distribution in the upper left of the population. The population model is learning how much variation to expect as well. And so I'm going to end this narrative here. We could go on forever, as you know, uh, visiting cafes, but uh, final visit to Cafe Beta, only the second visit, and you'll see Cafe Beta uh, again is in a busy place and gives a long waiting time, like 13 minutes, and uh, it starts to converge there. You'll see that there's a big departure from the prior because Cafe Beta seems to be really different than the others. Yeah, it's an extreme uh, sort of cafe sampled from the tail of that distribution in the upper left. This is the way multi-level models work, and the benefit of this is uh, it uses all the information by pooling information from the different subunits. It doesn't assume all the subunits are the same. I mean, the Starbucks coffees are all very similar, but they're not all identical. Um, and so we can do that with all kinds of, of uh, learning problems, it is not forgetting about all of the uh, units we visited so far when we visit the others, and pooling information across them. And what happens automatically uh, from this is regularization. And you remember regularization from the lecture on overfitting a few weeks ago. Uh, overfitting is this phenomenon where models essentially learn too much from the sample. They learn irregular features which do not generalize to future data. <clears throat> um, and what we're getting from, these, uh, from a multi-level model is this compromise between um, uh, overfitting and underfitting uh, that we think of as regularization. So the you want to think about this is that there's uh, three kinds of what statisticians call pooling. Um, there's complete pooling where we just collapse all the clusters together and treat them as identical. So this would be like saying all the cafes are the same uh, or all the stories are the same in the trolley data. And this tends to result in underfitting because um, you know, the model's not complex enough for the variation in the sample in the generative process. <clears throat> 
Then there's the no pooling approach where we treat all the clusters, uh, clusters here being cafes or uh, different stories or different individuals, as completely unrelated to one another. This is the model with no memory. And these are the sorts of models we've been using so far in this course, no pooling models. These tend to overfit. And they can radically overfit because often for any individual cluster, any any particular person uh, or story, uh, you may not have that, that much data. Uh, and yet you've got to estimate a parameter from the data you have. The last option, the best one in almost all circumstances, is partial pooling. Uh, and this is the, the model that I demonstrated um, in the previous slides. And this is an adaptive compromise that achieves uh, regularization. Yeah. Um, and there's an interesting idea uh, to think about getting this adaptive compromise, this benefit of navigating between overfitting and underfitting sort of automatically just from programming the model um, uh, to pool information across units uh, to learn about the population. Uh, as it goes, uh, because the population exists. So in, in essence, you just tell the model uh, that all these things are different, but they come from the, a population that has a mean and some variance, and it automatically does this regularization for you. Uh, I have the, the rabbit duck, famous rabbit duck drawing on here, because um, these two perspectives of thinking about multi-level models are really equivalent, and they arise from the same um, uh, structural features of the model. But they give you really different sensations of watching them, just as you can, you know, pivot in your mind's eye between the the duck and the rabbit uh, on the right. You can pivot in your mind's eye when thinking about multi-level models between the, the, their being efficient at learning and having memory and uh, uh, the goal of, reg of regularizing. But it, it's really the same thing. It's the same drawing. <clears throat> Okay, I want to give you an extended data analysis example um, uh, that's simpler than the trolley problem example to develop this in so we don't have to worry about awkward outcome variables like ordered categories. And uh, this is a data set that's in the rethinking package called Read Frogs, and it's um, from a set of experiments uh, trying to understand tadpoles. Uh, the tadpoles of Read Frogs. There are 48 groups, which I'm going to call tanks. I think they were aquariums. And uh, these are experimental groups where they put in different numbers of tadpoles and vary the density and size of the tadpoles and the presence or absence of predators, um, like dragonflies, I think. And what we're going to measure is survival. And these experiments uh, give you the citation at the bottom of the slide, uh, Vonish and Bolker, these experiments where we're trying to understand uh, well, anti-predator uh, responses and the kinds of trade-offs uh, that are involved in these things. We're going to DAG this. This is an experiment, so that makes it uh, easier. And uh, uh, there are survival there in the middle S is a zero one variable. It's it's at the tadpole level. Yeah, does the tadpole survive or not? Or you can think of it as the number of tadpoles that survived. And then we have the various uh, treatments uh, uh, along the bottom here: density D, the size G, uh, large or small. Density is the number of tadpoles. Um, and then the presence or absence of predators. Uh, and then there's this tank variable, which is just the identity of the tank. Um, but it's, it's there because uh, there are multiple tadpoles per tank, and there are certainly unmeasured things about each tank that may influence average survival within it. There's variation that is unrelated to the treatments. And this is one of those competing cause problems, just like the stories and individuals in the trolley problem data. This occurs in most sorts of data analysis situations when you have units within which there are repeated observations and we want to learn about um, the tendencies of those units and we want to use the data most efficiently and so we will often prefer multi-level models for estimating those tank level uh, unobserved forces so let's do that so think about the data this way. So arrayed along the horizontal axis of this plot, we just have the tanks, and there are 48 of them, and they start on number one on the left and go all the way to number 48 on the right. And they're in three groups. The low-density tanks, which are smaller, have fewer tadpoles, the mid-density tanks, uh, and the uh, high-density tanks. And then on the vertical, I've plotted the proportion survival, and this will be between 0 and 1. And the black dots are just empirical. This is the proportion of the tadpoles 
uh, that survived. And you'll see that there's a lot of variation. And that horizontal dash black line is the average survival across all tanks. Yeah, but you see how much variation there is. There's very few tanks that are near that average. So let's make a model, a multi-level model. Uh, so the first parts of this model will be familiar to you. This is just a binomial outcome variable. Let's think of S as the number that survive uh, out, of the, out of the total uh, that we're put in, which is the density D. So this is a binomial uh, outcome variable, which is uh, distributed, S sub i is distributed binomially uh, with number of trials, D sub i. And then the probability of survival is P sub i. And we put a logit link on that, as we've done in previous lectures. And we set that equal to some vector of parameters alpha, uh, or rather not the whole vector, but uh, uh, one component of that vector that is pulled out that is appropriate for the tank ti. Uh, but there'll be 48 of these, right? It's going to be 48 alpha uh, parameters. <clears throat> and then the question is, what uh, prior do we assign to it? And to make this a multi-level model, uh, the trick we do is we ask ourselves, um, how much do the tanks vary? And so in previous lectures, what we've done when we've put priors on this is you could say that there's some, some mean tank alpha bar in there, and often we would have set that to zero already, but the first thing we're gonna do is actually make a parameter for the average tank alpha bar, and we're gonna give that a normal uh, zero uh, 1.5 prior at the bottom. And then what do we do for the standard deviation? Do we also set that to 1.5? No, because we want to learn it. We want to learn how variable the tanks are. Just as we want to learn the average tank alpha bar, we'd like to learn the standard deviation among tanks as well in the log odds of survival. So think about it this way. We're going to, we're going to put a symbol sigma there. We don't know sigma. We're going to give it a prior, and we're going to treat it like any other kind of parameter. And now we have this weird thing on the screen. Alpha j is distributed as a normal variable with mean alpha bar and sigma. This looks like the way we've treated outcomes before in a linear regression. It looks like the top line of a linear regression, as your measurements have some mean and some standard deviation sigma, and we learn them from the data. We're doing exactly the same thing here, but we're doing it with another parameter. right? We have a bunch of parameters alpha. And they're distributed according to this normal model uh, that looks like a normal uh, uh, a linear regression. Yeah. And, uh, but this works just fine, right? Uh, parameters are just unobserved variables uh, in Bayes. And uh, we can do all the same things with them that we can do with observed variables. Yeah. Or maybe you would say a, an, a, a data is just a, an observed parameter. Okay. So let me explain the rest of this slide now. So at the top uh, part of this, I've repeated the tank data display as before. Remember, the black dots are the empirical averages. We just take the number of tadpoles that survived and we divide by the number that there were to start. That gives you the black dots up top. Um, and what I've added are all these little um, red dots and pink bars. And these are going to be our estimates uh, the, uh, the, of the alphas. And we're going to start with thinking about um, uh, sigma at different fixed values. We're not going to estimate it yet. We're going to walk our way there slowly. So I'm going to start sigma at 0.1, very narrow. And when you do that and you um, run the Bayesian model, uh, you get um, the posterior distributions in red and pink that I've showed you there. That is, you, we've made the prior really tight for the alphas. So we've basically told the model that the tanks are all really similar and we're sure of it. And so you'll notice what it does is it ends up collapsing all those estimates towards the mean. <clears throat> yeah. Where the, the red dash line, you can barely see it, is alpha bar. And, um, and, and what I'm showing you on the bottom is this prior. Yeah, is, it's, it's very tight. Yeah, there's a, it's centered on alpha bar, which is the average is somewhere around uh, 0.75, or it's a log odds a little under one. Um, but it's very narrow, and that's what creates this collapsing. But we can vary that and let sigma increase all the way up to 5, and then they spread apart. And then we have this prior that you see at the bottom now. What I've done here is I've done a really quick sweep from 0.1 all the way to 5, but we can focus on 5, and then we'll I'll animate it again so you can, you can appreciate the motion. But imagine instead we said sigma equals 5, a fixed value in the prior, so we're sure a priori that the tanks vary a lot. This allows um, uh, the model uh, 
to learn all the differences in the tanks. And now you see that the posterior distributions for each of the individual alphas, that's what's shown at the top of this slide, are laying on top of the black points. Yeah, because that's where they end up going. Because the prior doesn't create any constraints. It doesn't create any regularization, um, uh, at least not much here. Uh, it just lets the posterior distributions for alpha follow whatever happens in each tank as if the model had amnesia because the sigma equals five tells it you're not going to, the, the tanks are all really different. So there's no point in, in transferring information among them. Uh, and then at the bottom, I'm showing you the, post, the, the population model here that's learned, right? That's, a, that's the normal distribution uh, with mean alpha bar, which is where the red dash line is up top. Um, and the standard deviation five, right? It's a very wide distribution. And the vertical red bars are the individual tanks that are represented up top as well. So the, the, what I want you to get from this is that if we were to just put sigma in as a number, whether it's 0.1 or five, we're choosing a width of this prior distribution for the population. And then the consequence of that is it allows the individual estimates to be more or less different from one another. Okay. And this results in more and less overfitting, just as you've seen before. And there will be an optimal sigma uh, for learning. And we know how to learn that because I taught you how to do cross-validation. So we could find the optimal sigma through cross-validation. Yeah. Oh, those are the alpha tanks, yeah. So I was going to animate this again for you to show you as we sweep uh, from 0.1 to 5 and then back again. Uh, how the individual alpha estimates up top spread to find the data and then shrink back down towards the mean again because they can't move because the prior is so tight. And our job is to optimize sigma so that we get the optimal estimates. And what is that value? And it's gonna be somewhere between 0.1 and five um, uh, because 0.1 is radically underfit. It's the total pooling response. It says that all the tanks are the same and we that's not right. Uh, and five is overfit because it basically does, it doesn't do any pooling uh, between the tanks. Yeah, it lets whatever empirically happened in each tank completely determine uh, the posterior distribution for that tank. So somewhere in between, we could do better than that. But where is it? Well, as I, had, I said, we're going to find it through cross-validation. We can just take all the values of sigma between 0.1 and 5, and do the fitting uh, and, and loop over it um, uh, over and over again and plot the um, important sampling score, the cross-validation score uh, for the, each model with a different sigma plugged into it. So with, let's do that. I'm going to start at point 0.1 there. And so the model that has point 0.1 on the bottom graph has a PSIS score. Remember, this is the Pareto Smooth Important Sampling Score. Um, uh, getting up towards 600 there. And was it was like 560 or something. <clears throat> And remember, bigger numbers are bad in cross-validation because they're, they're deviances. And then we can do all the other uh, values on this graph. Uh, rather, the computer can. We can just set it up in a loop to take each value of sigma and fit a model. So this is what I've done here. And you can see that um, it starts to improve right away as we loosen up the prior. Uh, but then eventually, right around uh, um, 1.2, uh, we get the best fit, and then it, it very slightly starts to crawl back up again uh, as, as it goes out towards 5. Um, and so the, the, in this example, uh, through cross-validation, the optimal prior has a, has a sigma around 1.2 yeah, or 1.5, right around there. Um, but there's a range in that area where they're all basically the same. Yeah. Uh, right about here in this case, right? Yeah, 1.8 about in this example is the optimum. But by the time you get to 1.2, you're basically in the same place. So this is one of these features that I've often been telling people is that often the, the best prior is often narrower than you think it is. Yeah. And this illustrates this thing that often that disturbs some people. We're choosing a prior um, uh, by fitting the model to data. But what I want you to notice is we didn't choose this prior by the fit of the model. We choose it by its cross-validation score. Yeah, this is the idea is that, that we've, we want a prior so that the model trains well and doesn't overfit. We're not evaluating the model on how well it fits the sample. Yeah, we're evaluating on the model how well it fits the out of sample.
I'll say that again. We have not chosen a prior and evaluated the model on the basis of the, how it fits the sample, but on how well it fits the out of sample. And that's perfectly legitimate. This is done all the time in machine learning. It's a very common thing for hyperparameter optimization like this. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, so if you zoom in here, we set sigma to, to 1.79 and look at the estimates. What I want you to see, as, since we're zoomed in, is now the posterior distribution. So the red portion, that's the posterior mean, and I think the 89% uh, interval, and then the pink part is like the 95% interval. And um, what I want you to see is that in many cases, uh, uh, the center of the posterior distribution is not on the empirical data, is not on the black dot. Instead, uh, and when it's not, it deviates in a particular direction, which is towards the global mean, towards the average of the population of tanks. And this is the result of regularization, of partial pooling. It's a phenomenon that's known as shrinkage because the, um, the means of the posterior distributions for each of these alpha parameters has been shrunk towards the global mean. Now, um, in many cases, we don't want to do this through cross-validation, although it's perfectly fine to do so. Wouldn't it be nice if we could find sigma some other way? And we can, and I've already told you uh, we're going to do this. We're just going to make it a parameter and stick it in the model and learn it directly from the data without any cross-validation at all. Uh, but I'm going to show you that after the break. Uh, I know conceptually this has been a bit of a sprint. I encourage you to review the first half of this lecture uh, before you continue. You can, you can play it back on double speed if you like. Um, and then take a break and take care of yourself. And when you come back, I will still be here. Now I want to show you, as I promised before the break, um, uh, how to learn the optimal sigma, well, the posterior distribution for it, uh, from the data directly without the cross-validation exercise. Uh, so just to remind you, here's our tank model, uh, the empirical data represented in the upper left of this slide, uh, the simple experimental DAG on the bottom left, and the model we're going to use, and this is like baby's first multi-level model, is shown on the right. This is a binomial outcome variable, and we're using a logit link. As before, we've got a vector of alphas, and the prediction for each tadpole comes from taking the, the alpha that's specific to that tadpole's tank, ti, um, and the prior we apply to every element of that alpha vector for each alpha sub j, where j is some tank, has two parameters inside of it. It's a normal distribution with some mean alpha bar that we don't know yet and some standard deviation sigma that we don't know yet. And this is the sigma uh, from that we tuned during cross-validation before the break. And we give priors to these. A good prior for alpha bar is our kind of default uh, logit space prior, right? Remember, you, you don't want these priors in logit space to be too wide because that piles up all the probability mass on zero and one. Um, but 1.5 gives you something that looks approximately flat in the probability space. And then for sigma, I'm going to use this default exponential one. Um, uh, not a particular choice for doing that, uh, but in the homework, I'm going to encourage you to do a prior predictive simulation to explore what sort of average you would like this exponential distribution to have uh, for sigma. But for now, let's just see what happens when we fit this model. Um, <clears throat> oh, here are the priors and what they mean. I should have put this up. So the sigma exponential uh, uh, with a rate of one looks like that. Yeah, uh, that means that the, the average is one, and that's really the only information in such a prior in an exponential distribution is its average uh, and that it's a positive real. Um, and then uh, uh, the prior distribution for alpha bar shown up top there is just a plain old uh, vanilla normal distribution with a standard deviation of 1.5. Um, but notice that the prior distribution for alpha j uses both of these parameters, and so it's averaged over them, and it's uncertain, and it isn't a normal distribution, actually. It's got thicker tails than that, and that's what I show you at the bottom there for alpha j. Yeah, it's like a, it's a mixture of normal distributions with different means and different variances. 
<clears throat> fit this data, there's really no new technology involved. Uh, we uh, load the data, set up our trim data list as usual. I make a tank index variable there. Um, there's one tank on each row uh, in this data frame. And then we can use a new model to run it. Um, it's binomial, and there's no surprises, I think, in the, in the notation. Uh, well, I wanted you to notice I've, I've turned on log like uh, equals true here so that we can do some model comparison in a moment. Okay, if you run this model, you won't encounter any problems. It samples very efficiently, and if you look at the Precy output, it's terrifying. Uh, but I just do this, not because I want to encourage you to do this. Well, you should look at these things to see the R hats and NF values, but um, you're not going to interpret all of these things. I just want to show you that you really do get, uh, you get 50 parameters in this model. Um, and uh, 48 of them are these alpha values. Yeah, uh, one for each tank. And then the mean alpha bar and sigma at the very bottom. Uh, what I do want you to do is look at the values for alpha bar and sigma because these tell you the, the uh, posterior distribution of the population. Now remember, these are posterior distributions. They're not just the mean. There's no point estimates in Bayes ever. Um, uh, but you can, so you, it, the minimum is to look at the mean and the standard deviation, uh, but you can look at the range and see what's going on here. The high, what matters is the high density region of each of these things. And, uh, for, for a bar, it's, it's, uh, right around 1.35 and <clears throat> for Sigma, it's around 1.6, but it ranges from 1.3 to 2. And so let's put that posterior distribution of sigma over what we got before from the cross-validation exercise. And you'll see that it's the high density region of that posterior distribution for sigma is right over the range of uh, sigmas that give us good um, uh, cross-validation scores. And this is the thing about multi-level models. They uh, essentially regularize for free. Uh, they learn the population variation from the sample. They learn the prior from the sample as they're, as they're learning about the sample. And uh, this has lots of great features. Um, uh, it learns efficiently, so you need less data to get good estimates and achieve regularization. Let's do a quick comparison so I can draw out another point here that I think is important, especially when you're starting out in this business. Um, Let's fit a model that uh, isn't multi-level, yeah, the, the no memory model. So on the top of this slide, I'm just showing you the multi-level model for the tadpole data. Again, there's no changes there. It's the model we just fit and visualized. And then on the bottom half of the slide, we modify this so that sigma is fixed uh, at one. Uh, you can see there in the, in the prior uh, for the tanks, it's, uh, it's a normal distribution with mean a bar, but standard deviation one now. So we removed a parameter, yeah? So the model up top has 50 parameters uh, and the, the model at the bottom uh, has uh, 49. And we can fit both these models and we can compare them using WAIC or important sampling. You'll get, you'll get the same answer. And here's what you get. Um, the uh, multi-level model um, is does better in, in cross-validation. That's not gonna surprise you. That's, that was the whole point of tuning sigma. Um, but what might surprise you is that the estimated number of parameters or the penalty is actually uh, substantially smaller uh, for the multi-level model, even though it has fewer parameters. I'll say that again. The, the effective number of parameters, uh, the PWAIC for the multi-level model is actually smaller than, than the model that has um, one fewer parameter. And the reason is because in these sorts of models, it's not the parameter count that determines how the model behaves. It's how the parameters are related to one another. And when parameters are hierarchically embedded in one another, and that's, that's why these models are sometimes called hierarchical models or multi-level models, you have priors that have parameters in them. And so priors depend upon priors. When that's true, uh, your intuition is essentially useless about how these models are going to behave. And you just got to let go of thinking that they should be intuitive. Over time, you'll get used to their behavior and you'll come to explain it uh, as if it were intuitive, uh, but don't fool yourself. The way these machines work is not intuitive uh, uh, to hardly anybody at all. But um, what you should expect is normal in this case, since the multi-level model learns a better uh, range of values for sigma, it does less overfitting, uh, 
that means it's actually uh, uh, less has less overfitting risk than the model with a fixed sigma, which is weird, right? Now, maybe in some intro uh, statistics course, you were taught every time you add a parameter, the model will overfit more, uh, but that's just not true anymore uh, for models. For multi-level models, it's not true at all. You can actually add parameters, sometimes hundreds or thousands of them, and uh, get less overfitting. That's why we add them. That's the whole point of, of doing partial pooling. <clears throat> right, so what matters is structure. Okay, let's look at what happens in the estimates that we got now, because you can see this pattern that the um, regularization that results depends upon how much evidence there is in each tank. So on the far left here, again, in this graph, when I'm showing you the, the dark points, that's the empirical outcomes from each tank, how, what proportion survived in each tank. And then the um, pink bars, I think that's the 95% um, percentile intervals for the posterior distribution for each alpha. And the red circles are the posterior means. And uh, you'll see on the far left, uh, there's uh, the bars are quite long or tall, I guess, in this case. And um, the, the red circles are further away, uh, uh, often sometimes substantially far away from the black dots. Yeah, but all, they're all shrunk towards the mean. It's like they're, they're trying to get close to one another, right? Um, and then in the middle, uh, it's a similar phenomenon, but the red circles are closer now to the, to the black points. They're still not exactly on them, but they're closer. And that's because the tanks in the middle were the medium-sized tanks. They had more tadpoles. And so there's more evidence about what exactly happened in that tank. Yeah. Uh, and then on the far right, these are the largest tanks with the most tadpoles. And we see uh, an even uh, smaller discrepancy between what happened empirically, the empirical average in each tank. Um, and uh, and the Bayesian estimate, the, the regularized estimates. But also notice that the tanks that are most different from the mean, the ones that are furthest towards the bottom, um, in those tanks, the center of the posterior distribution is furthest, or is further from the empirical average, right? And this is because those are extreme events that are really far out in the tail of the distribution. So the model is more skeptical that that is the long run behavior of that tank. It thinks it's a fluke uh, because it's out in the tail. There's a lot, I mean, this is an experiment and a lot of the variation among tanks here is arising from the experimental treatments, which we have not added yet, right? But that that's fine. We, uh, we weren't trying to estimate that. We were just trying to estimate um, if we were going to have more tadpoles in exactly these tanks, uh, which we're not, uh, what should we predict? Um, but one of the uh, experimental treatments is the presence or absence of predators. And I've added some coloring here to show you this. The, the blue are tanks where predators are absent, and the red are tanks where predators are present. And uh, unsurprisingly, there's less survival when predators are present. Um, and this some of the variation among tanks, uh, some of that sigma uh, that was learned um, for the width of the population of tanks is due to this experimental treatment. And so when you start working with multi-level models and you put in treatment variables uh, that you want to measure things from, what's going to happen is that that st standard deviation uh, among the units is going to shrink. So I wanted to show you an example of that. So now we take that same model and we um, stratify the log odds by whether predators are absent or not. And I just create a variable P sub I, which is the presence or absence of predators, and give it a coefficient, uh, beta sub P, um, with this uh, normal 0.5 um, prior. This, remember, this is on the log odds. And we can run the same model. And uh, uh, here's what it looks like in code form. There's nothing really new here. Yeah, it's basically copy and paste the previous thing and add a couple of uh, one line. Um, and here's the posterior distribution for beta sub p. Uh, predators have a negative effect on survival. You're not surprised, right? Uh, this was not the point of the experiment, by the way. They knew that tadpoles would, would die. Um, let me show you what happens, though, in this sort of model. The predictions of the model are essentially the same between this model and the previous one. That is, the model that ignores predators, the first one we did, um, and the model that has predators in it, uh, they make very similar predictions. And that's because the, um, uh, the, the alphas for each tank can learn the behavior of each tank without it needing to be explained at all. So on the 
the graph you see on the screen, um, each point is a tank, and the blue tanks are the ones that had um, uh, no predators, and the red tanks are ones that had predators. And the horizontal axis is the uh, posterior mean probability of survival um, in the model that ignored predators, just the original multi-level model, and the vertical axis is the posterior mean probability of survival in the model that we just fit on the previous slide, the model with predators in it. And the horizontal line, I mean the diagonal line, shows where they would agree, and you'll see they almost entirely agree. Now these models make extremely similar predictions um, because the, the multi-level model can learn the different behavior in the tanks without needing it to explain it with treatment at all. Uh, that's what you asked it to do, and it did. Okay, uh, but the, what the models learned about the variation among tanks is quite different. Uh, so the uh, variation is, is not quite halved here, yeah, uh, almost, um, in, by adding predators, which is to say that the predator variable has explained away about half of the variation on the log odd scale among the tanks. Yeah, so you get very different sigma values where the, the red posterior distribution on the right is the posterior, distri posterior distribution of sigma when the predator variable is added and the blue when it's not. So the models make very similar predictions, um, but you need to interpret the sigma parameter depending upon what else is in the model because it's not, it's not the variation among the units, among the tanks. It's the variation among the parameters net all the other effects in the model. Yeah, you get used to this uh, after a while. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Um, let me try to summarize a bit. So this is the, the multi-level tadpoles example, and uh, this is also done in the book a lot. And there's a simulation, and I encourage you to deal with to work with that and, and uh, spend some time on this example. Make sure you understand the basic concepts, because as we move forward, we're going to add extra stuff. Yeah. Uh, but the, these types of models are workhorse models in all branches of science now because multi-level models use the data more efficiently and, and uh, they reduce overfitting at the same time. These alpha parameters um, are, I call them, I tend to call them varying effects. Uh, they're effects that vary among units. Uh, they're partially pooled estimates, but different people call them different things. And uh, it can be quite confusing. Sometimes they'll be called random effects. Um, and uh, uh, what does that even mean for an effect to be random, right? Uh, and what you have to do is just get a definition of the model, uh, see the code, see the math stats definition of the model to understand what's been done. There's different disciplines, um, even use the word random effect in different ways. It doesn't even always mean the same thing. And it's just unfortunately true. Uh, so you just have to ask for the model definition in detail. Um, you might ask what happens if we add the other treatment variables, uh, uh, examine their effects, the effect of density and the effect of size. Uh, density is already in the model, but we could also put it in the linear model because right now it's only in the model as the number of tadpoles, but it could have effects above and beyond that because of crowding. Um, and, uh, and then the size of the tadpoles, G, uh, as well. And you're going to uh, work on that in the homework. Uh, to model that out. Okay, I want to round this lecture out by by dealing with a few things that I think of are basically superstitions about multi-level models or varying effects. Um, and there's a lot of this uh, kind of just bad, wrong heuristics that people use about these models. So when should we use partial pooling? And my default answer is it should be your default. There are good reasons not to use it but they're rare relative to the number of reasons to use it. And so your default should be to use a multi-level structure and use partial pooling. But um, uh, you'll get the opposite advice from many people. And so I want to push back against that because I think that opposite advice comes from a place of superstition. Uh, one of the things you'll hear is that the units, in order to justify using varying effects or partial pooling, the different units, that is the different tanks or um, stories or individuals must be sampled at random from some population. And this is just wrong. Uh, it has nothing to do with that. I mean, think about the cafe example. Uh, there's no sense in which these the Starbucks were randomly sampled. It doesn't matter. The, the whole justification for doing partial pooling is that you learn faster. Yeah, it has nothing to do with any metaphysical beliefs you have about the nature of the units or how they got into your data set. It just doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, the second thing that people will say is that the number of units must be large, that you need lots of cafes or lots of individuals or lots of stories or you know, lots of classrooms or whatever it is you're modeling. And again, this is just not true. It's some arbitrary imposed metaphysical belief that has nothing to do with the updating benefits of using partial pooling at all. Again, it could just be two cafes and you should already want to do it. Yeah. And there's also no sample size constraint or anything like that. It's the best way to learn at any sample size for any number of units. Um, third thing is people will say, ah, oh, but these models assume that the variation among units is normally distributed. And you probably at this point are getting to know me and so you know what I'm going to say. Um, this is just completely wrong. It's a deep misunderstanding about what probability theory is. So the the distributions in statistical models are not claims about the frequency distributions uh, of the objects in the real world. They're priors. They're prior expectations before we see the data. Yeah. And so a Gaussian prior is not a claim that the data look normal. Yeah. It's a prior expectation for the, well, only for the residuals even after net the other effects for the error variance. Uh, but the posterior distribution doesn't have to be Gaussian. Bayesian models with a, with a, Gaussian prior can learn non-Gaussian variation. So I just um, uh, showing you a, a cooked up example uh, on the right. Uh, here's a multi-level model I ran that had, I think, literally uh, thousands of individual units in it, clustered units. Um, uh, and the, the real underlying data is only zeros and ones. Um, uh, but but the prior was normally distributed. And But look, the, uh, the model... Uh, uh, the posterior distributions for um, uh, each individual uh, in, in the model uh, are always clustered around zero and one. They're not on it exactly because the prior is Gaussian, and so it allows them to vary, but notice it makes two clusters. It doesn't put all the individuals on the mean uh, because the prior is just a prior, and the individual uh, posterior distributions for each of the clusters is free to move away from that prior and learn its own thing, just as the posterior distributions for each cafe could deviate from the distribution for the population of cafes. That said, if you want to use a non-Gaussian prior in a multi-level model, nothing's stopping you. Yeah, you can do it, and you can do partial pooling with other kinds of distributions as well. You just need to make them functions of parameters and then learn those parameters while the model is fitting. OK, there are technological issues with using these models as they get more complex complicated. This is one of the reasons we're using Markov chain Monte Carlo is because it's uh, the most practical way for scientists on the desktop to fit these models. Um, and then there are issues about uh, learning how to use them to model your um, studies. So uh, the first thing is, for example, how do we use more than one cluster at the same time? Say like in the trolley problem data, we want to put both stories and participants in there. The example I've showed you so far is just tanks. Um, can we add more? Uh, and the answer is yes, we can, but there are some things you need to think about when you do that. Um, second is how to get the Markov chains to sample efficiently. And now we're entering this fun territory. I use fun ironically, where for any given estimator, there'll be different ways to code it. And some of those ways are much better than others, uh, like the bad ones just won't run. Uh, but mathematically, they're the same model, the same estimator. But in the code, there's just different choices we can make that change how the changes how the math works in the computer, and it can make a big difference. Um, and then, what about all the other kinds of parameters uh, inside these models? Can't we use partial pooling on those too? What about slopes? Uh, and the answer is, of course, we can. Uh, if you you can you can partially pool any batch of parameters that have the 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 same basic meaning across units. And in future lectures, I'll show you how to deal with all three of these things. All right. Thanks for your attention. The whole point of this lecture was to prepare you uh, for uh, next week, where we're going to learn more about multi-level models. And then we're going to start doing cool things with them, like social networks and phylogenies and such. So I hope uh, to see you there.
Okay, I'm going to muster the energy to do a bonus. This is the longest requested bonus content uh, since I started teaching the course, I think, more than a decade ago. And the topic, the topic is how to deal with confounding and the estimation uh, under partial pooling. I'm going to need some background here to understand what's going on. So it's often plausible that there are unmeasured confounds at the group level, that is uh, some aspect of the group uh, that is a confound because it influences the outcome variable of interest and the treatment of interest. So if you look at the DAG on the right of this slide, you'll see that uh, you know, we're thinking about the tadpoles. I'll explain this in some detail in a second. Uh, G is our unobserved group feature, or probably more than one feature. And there are arrows going both to the outcome S and to the treatment X. So it's a confound. It creates a backdoor path. Uh, and we, we know that we want to close backdoor paths, but we haven't measured G. Well, there's some tricks up our sleeves when we have repeat observations. This literature is very confusing, which is why I'm often asked to talk about it, because every field and even every subfield uses different terminologies and seems to have a different modeling preference. Uh, so it's incredibly confusing. Things are often sometimes called group level confounding. The word endogeneity gets thrown around as if that resolved the ambiguity. Um, correlated errors uh, people talk about. And then there's this field called econometrics where um, all of their terminology is different. Uh, the basic issue is that group level variables can have direct and indirect influences and we need to think about that uh, when we when we draw our generative models. So let's build this up one step at a time and then I'll show you some of the models that are used in this area and um, explain the options and, and the sorts of problems that each addresses. So again think about the tadpoles, keep things simple. Uh, we've got uh, unobserved features of the tank that will affect uh, survival, and that's um, uh, something that we need to be worry about to estimate other parts of the experiment, uh, the treatment of interest that's coming. There are also measured features of the group or tank. Here I'm going to call them Z. These are things that are uh, features of the tank, so every tadpole in the tank experiences the same Z. Yeah, this is like, let's call this a group level variable or group trait. And then there's the thing of interest, which varies at the individual level. These are things we might measure about each individual tadpole, and we're interested in the causal effects of those individual level traits on survival. And then the problem can arise that it's, it's often very plausible that um, unmeasured features of the cluster of the group of the tank, in this case, that can influence survival directly may also influence it indirectly mediated through the traits of individuals. Yeah, um, let me give you, uh, uh, wait, so here's the idea. Our S demand is um, the distribution of survival can, uh, uh, intervening on X, and the problem is there's a backdoor path through G. So what can we do about that? If you want to think about some examples, maybe tadpoles aren't your favorite thing and you can't think about how this would work, but you know, it could be that there's um, uh, uh, some feature of the tank like temperature that affects individual growth and also immediately survival. And so it has two routes towards affecting survival, both through long-term effects on individuals and immediate effects on individuals uh, uh, at the time of death. Um, <clears throat> uh, often uh, this literature talks about classrooms because these sorts of models are used a lot in measuring student progress and doing teacher evaluations. And so you can think about the clusters now as being classrooms, and classrooms have lots of uh, things about them that make them different from one another, and many of them are unmeasured or even unimagined. Um, and we're interested in the effect of student preparation, which has got a subscript I on it because it applies to each individual student, and test scores, S sub I, which again is a feature of the individual student. Um, and then there are measured things about the classrooms like temperature Z at the bottom. What could be unmeasured about classrooms? It could be noisy classrooms that uh, directly reduce test scores because it's hard to take the test in the noisy classroom. Uh, but noisy classrooms could also reduce student preparation. And so there could be a direct and indirect effect. Um, political scientists are interested in time varying versions of this problem where the the individuals are individual time points and they're clustered by country or nation. <clears throat> and so, for example, people might ask how um, 
uh, which party is ruling a country at any point in time t, how that influences the economy at t or uh, sometime after t. And there are things we've measured about the resources or infrastructure of these of these countries that we think might influence the economy as well, be a competing cause. Uh, but there are lots of unmeasured things, plausibly, uh, that we haven't even imagined. And those things might influence both who is uh, who becomes a ruling party and the economy directly. For example, uh, when the economy takes a certain state, um, through these influences, uh, uh, those influences might simultaneously result in certain um, uh, styles of politics becoming popular. Okay, so what do we do? We've got our estimate. We want to influence. We want to measure the influence of X on Y. Uh, we know there's a confound G. We or we believe there's a confound G. It's often a good assumption. And so what we can what can we do? And this is one of those cases where uh, there are multiple estimators and they all have trade offs. Um, and I want to walk you through the issues involved. Uh, the first one is the so called fixed effects model. This is very popular in uh, well lots of fields actually, um, and it's 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 a reasonable choice. I'm not going to tell you not to use it, but it's got some drawbacks, and I want to uh, explain those to you. I also want to explain to you why it can work. Um, the second is a multi-level model, and I'm going to show you uh, what the sort of naive multi-level model, which is not, doesn't take the confounds into account, what it does, um, uh, how it behaves in this circumstance. And then we're going to fix the naive multi-level model. Uh, well, fix it. It wasn't broken in the first place. Uh, the naive multi-level model just didn't account for the confounding. So we're going to use a multi-level model that does. And, and uh, I like to call these Mundlach machines. Mundlach was a man. He was an agricultural economist who was interested in these problems. OK, so <clears throat> to do this, we want to simulate some data so we know the right answer. Uh, so that's what I'm doing on this slide, the code at the top. I've got 30 groups. Um, and you can think about these as tadpoles, if you like, uh, where y will be survival and x will be some feature of the tadpole, like its health. Uh, and z is something else we measure about it. Or you can think about it as students in classrooms, where y is test scores and x is how much they study. And the unmeasured g things are unmeasured things about the classrooms. Uh, and Z is uh, you know, the teacher or something like that. Um, and uh, so I have, we have 30 groups, uh, tanks or classrooms, uh, 200 tadpoles or students. Uh, and I, I create some uh, regression parameters there at the top. Uh, the minus two is the overall rate of the outcome. This is a binary outcome. So it happens less than half the time across all the units. And then uh, I create an effect for z on y, and I have it be slightly negative, minus 0.5. And then uh, that lowercase g vector, I just sample tadpoles into tanks or students into groups at random. This means that some groups have more tadpoles slash students uh, than others. And you can see the table of that on the bottom, right? So there, there are some groups, like uh, group number one has 11, but group number two only has five students. And then the u sub g's are our unobserved confounds. The u for unobserved and the, the g subscript that, that, that there's one for each group. And I just sample those. And they vary quite a bit across groups, a standard deviation of 1.5. Um, then uh, I sample the x's. Uh, these are individual level variables. There's one for each individual uh, tadpole slash student. Uh, but their mean is the unobserved confounds in each group. I'll say that again. We sample the individual x's. There's 200 of them. But the mean uh, in each group is that unobserved u sub g. Yeah. Uh, and that's where the confounding comes in, is the, that the individual level traits are caused partly by those that unobserved group confound, unobserved group variable. Um, then simulate disease, and then finally uh, the master uh, equation at the bottom there. This is just a random Bernoulli variable where the probability of, of each y sub i is the sum of all those things, where there's some global intercept alpha uh, zero, which, which again is i set to minus two so that the event usually doesn't happen, um, net the other effects, and then x. Notice I just add x here, which means its coefficient is one. And we want to keep that in mind as we look through the, the following slides. And then the confound, and again, I make it just as strong as x, um, just for the sake of the example. So the confounding is, is obvious. You can make the confounding weak, and then you could ignore the whole problem, right? So I want to give you a case where it's strong. And then we add the z. 
yeah and the z uh, is uh, it made its coefficient slightly negative minus 0.5 okay let's make some models first the fixed effects model and the fixed effect model um, what you do is you do what we've been doing since the beginning of the course you have all these units uh, groups and you're going to treat their index as a create a categorical index for the groups and you're going to make a big vector of of intercept parameters of alphas uh, we've been doing this for a long time i didn't those models are often called fixed effects models and the idea is you have repeat observations within each of those clusters and you estimate a unique alpha for each but you do it without pooling so the no pooling so it's a fixed prior um, and in non-Bayesian approaches, the prior has an infinite variance even, right? We're not going to do something that silly, but um, it's a fixed prior, and so you don't get any pooling. Uh, so the alphas only are, are only learned from the data within each group um, at the prior. And uh, these models can work. I'm going to show you in a second that this can deconfound, and the reason is actually pretty weird. Um, but they're inefficient because uh, there's no pooling. Uh, but, uh, but that inefficiency actually allows them to soak up the, the confounding effect, right? And the reason is because um, the intercepts essentially uh, fit the, the average confounding effect because there's one intercept for all of the individuals in the group. And remember, the confound was just added in the generative simulation. I'll go back to the previous slide and show it to you. So you look at the line that generates y, you see that the the unobserved UG is just added in there. And so when we estimate alpha, we're estimating that value. And that's, that's why it works. Clever, huh? Um, the problem here, well, there's multiple problems. Uh, the first problem <clears throat> uh, is, as I said, it's inefficient. Uh, we, we'd like some pooling on these alphas, but uh, uh, we'll get to that in, the, in, in a few slides. The second problem <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is, is going here. Um, the second problem is when we do this, when we use fixed effects, we can't include Z. I'll say that again. When we use fixed effects, we can't include Z. And that's because it becomes unidentifiable to separate uh, the effect of Z from uh, the global intercept because they're both just added to every prediction within each group. You look at the, the model on the right uh, for prediction of every case I, uh, there's alpha gi and there's um, uh, zgi times some coefficient. And so the values of those two parameters, uh, alpha g and uh, uh, the alpha for each group and uh, beta z times the z of each group, there's just an infinite number in principle of combinations of parameter values that'll, that'll fit. And so only the prior ends up mattering. Uh, in this case, and I'll show you the consequence of that. And so what you'll read in, in like econometric textbooks is that you just can't include group level predictors. The group level predictors are sometimes the whole research question. Yeah, like teacher effects or something like that. And um, in that case, you're sunk and the fixed effect strategy actually blocks you from being able to progress. Here's what it looks like in Ulam code. I don't think there'll be any surprises here. Um, uh, because these are, this is just a categorical model like we did in the second week of the course. And then at the uh, bottom of the slide, I show you the posterior distribution, samples from the posterior distributions um, for the fixed model in the dark black line. That's the model we're looking at, the fixed effects model. And the gray density is a model that I, I'm going to call the naive model, and I haven't shown you code for that. But that's just the model. If you took the model, the fixed effects model, and you took the subsetting off of alpha so that there's the same alpha for every group, that's the naive model. It's the model that ignores the group differences completely, yeah, and just uses x and z for each group as ordinary predictors. And unsurprisingly, that model is confounded. Uh, so if you look at the lower left densities, the vertical dashed line is the true effect we know from the generative model. Now, we don't expect any particular sample uh, to exactly get that, but we'd like the high density regions of the posterior distributions to cover the true value. I'll say that again. You should never expect any particular sample to exactly and precisely give you the true data generating value, but it'd be nice if most of the time the posterior distributions, the high density regions of the posterior distributions are over the true values. Yeah. And we see that's true for the fixed effect model in the lower left, um, but it's not for the naive model, and that's just the expected effect of, of the confounding. It's The effect is overestimated because it's getting like a double dose, right? It's getting it from the XIs, and it's getting it from the UGs. 
Um, and the naive model ignores the group differences. But the fixed effect model nets out that constant effect um, uh, by putting it into the intercepts. And then in the lower left, we look at the coefficient estimates for z, and this is the flip side. The naive model gets it right on the money. It does a fantastic job estimating the group level of uh, cause z. Um, but the fixed effect model is hopeless here, right? It knows nothing, uh, absolutely nothing. And that's because that's what I told you of this effect, that it can't separate the intercepts from the coefficient on z. And it's a, it's a completely undetermined sort of modeling problem. This is well known, by the way, uh, uh, and fixed effect models just don't allow you to insert to include group level predictors. Okay, multi level model. Multi level model has got a different problem, and that is that it ignores the confound. Well, it doesn't ignore it. Uh, it, it often does better than the naive model, uh, but it's still subject to more confounding because of the partial pooling, right? Which is a good thing. Remember, I keep telling you we like partial pooling, and we do. We really do. Um, but the partial pooling. Uh, uh, pulls the intercepts towards one another, remember, especially for groups that don't have a lot of individuals in them, a lot of tadpoles or students. And as a consequence, it compromises on identifying the confound um, uh, so that it can get better estimates of the average tendencies of the group. And there's lots of things, not just the confound that, uh, that vary by group. And some of them are just pure direct effects. So the, the, the intercept is a mix of a lot of things in principle. And so maybe we want a good estimate of it. <clears throat> uh, but the, the multi-level model is, is essentially designed ignoring the confound in a way. And um, even though on average it does better than the naive model, it won't do as well as the fixed effects model on average. But it often does pretty well, surprisingly. You can try some simulations and, and see. But I'm going to show you a case where it does worse because um, that's the expectation. So you get better estimates uh, 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 for the groups, uh, the average tendencies of the groups, the unmeasured features of groups, and a worse estimate for X, which is weird, right? Um, but you can include group level predictors, uh, which, you know, again, may be the whole point of your research, would be things that apply to the group. So let me show you what the code looks like and show you how it does. Uh, so again, upper left, here's the code. There's a little bit of weird machinery in this ULAM model that I'm going to teach you next week, and I apologize for, for breaking up the timeline here, but getting this model to run uh, appropriately requires this technique called uh, non-centered priors, and that's all that's going on there. But if you just ignore that transpars uh, line, you can read the model normally. Um, and this is just a plain multi-level model. There's an alpha for each group, and we use partial pooling. There's an, an alpha bar, and a, uh, I call it tau instead of sigma, but it's just a scale parameter, just like sigma. Uh, it's the standard deviation across groups, and we include x and the z. Um, and we run this, and you see at the bottom the updated posterior distributions. In the lower left, uh, the effect of x on y. And uh, you can see it's a little better than the naive model uh, by, by distinguishing the groups, um, uh, but it's not as good as the fixed effects model. It's been uh, only, it's a compromise between the two, uh, just as partial pooling is a compromise between the fixed effects model and the naive model. So in some sense, this is obvious in hindsight. Uh, in the lower right, the multi-level model identifies Z. Yeah, and <clears throat> just like the naive model does, there's been no change there. Okay. So people have known about this uh, uh, kind of problem and this trade-off for a long time, about the fixed effects models um, being better at um, removing group-level confounding, but uh, multi-level models being better at estimation and therefore prediction. So if you were purely interested in prediction, there'd be no reason to use the fixed effects model, right? But if you're interested in inference on do x, right, on causal inference for the effect of x um, or some other variable, then you might want to use the fixed effects model and just not care about predictive accuracy at the group level. Um, but you can have your cake and eat it too. Uh, and uh, I'm going to introduce you two more models, and then I'm done here. Uh, the first, I call this the Mundlach machine, and Mundlach was a man. I said he's an agricultural economist. Um, and I'll give you the citation to the paper on the bottom. This is a very difficult paper to read if you're not trained in, in statistics, I'm afraid. But there's lots of other papers that cite it that explain it very well. And so if, I, if you're interested in this literature, I would do a, a citation search on Mundlach and, and find another paper. Uh, that, that explains his paper. But that said, I'm going to try to explain the key insight to you right here. Uh, 
Um, so that what the Mundlack machine does, you look at the DAG on the right of this slide, is it notes that we have something else. We have an average X within each group. So you take up all the XIs that are in any particular group, little g, and you average them, you've got this thing uh, X bar, which is the average. And that's also a descendant of the unobserved confound. And so it gives us information about it. So if we condition on that descendant, on X bar for each group, and treat it like a group level variable, that will partly deconfound. Yeah, the inference of the influence of X sub i on Y sub i. Yeah, because remember, conditioning on a descendant is, is like conditioning on the parent. I uh, taught you this in, I think it was week two or week three. Um, it was week three, uh, but is not as effective. Yeah, because uh, X bar is not a copy of the unmeasured aspects in the circle with G there. So this, this works. Uh, it's got some inefficiencies, but you get to have uh, partial pooling. So you get gr good group effects. You get a more deconfounded, uh, a better deconfounded um, treatment effective X, uh, X sub I that is. Uh, but there's a new, in, a new problem here is that um, this is not very efficient because this is not a proper way to respect the uncertainty in X bar. We don't actually know X bar. I mean, you think you know X bar, you just average the data, but Look, it, it, the uncertainty in it varies by group. Some groups have a dozen individuals in them in the simulation I showed you, and some have three. Uh, we're ignoring the variation in the quality of the measurement of X bar across groups when we include it like a known variable like this. So we're going to fix that too, but hang on. All right, so you get this big uh, logic prediction equation at the bottom there, and on the far right, you'll see that I've added a new beta coefficient for X bar, and we just include X bar as a data point. And this is the Mudlack machine. And it's genius, actually. It's genius. Um, <clears throat> and there's the code for it uh, up top. I construct X bar just by uh, looping over groups and using the mean function, and you just drop it in as data. Uh, and then we update the posterior distributions uh, at the bottom, and I've drawn Mundlack in blue. And you'll see Mundlack is, in this particular example, very deconfounded. He's flown over to the other side a little bit. But there's a lot of probability density over the true value. This is, this is not a terrible job. And, uh, and Mundlack still can model group-level effects you'll see on the right. It's, it's piling up with all the others. It's only the fixed effects model that sucks at estimating Z. Okay, one more, and then I'm done. Uh, let's fix the problem of improperly respecting the uncertainty in X bar. Uh, this is an example of this full luxury Bayes thing that I've shown you in multiple bonus rounds, I think, so far. Um, this is my joking uh, uh, language. It's meant to be ironic. Uh, but the idea is we take the generative model, the DAG, and we express all of its relationships in a single Markov chain. That's the idea. Um, you could call this the latent Mundlack machine because we don't include X bar as data, but we estimate X bar using the observed X size. Yeah, and then we get a posterior distribution for it, and we can include that as a predictor. Um, so in principle, what this means is we run two simultaneous regressions. Yeah, so let me, let me split up this DAG and show you what I mean. We're gonna have a model for Y, and in the, uh, it says it's at the top of the screen, and so the, the code in the upper left, this is the Bernoulli outcome Y, and it is influenced by unmeasured um, uh, group things alpha for each group and also uh, then the xi and then z and then on the end of this line I've added this uh, u for each g this is the unobserved confound that we'd like to estimate and this is just a parameter yeah but don't panic uh, we're going to estimate it. and then I have this transpars line again which I said uh, don't look I'll explain that to you next week and then the x model um, and the x model in the middle x is only influenced by the confound Right? That was the generative model. That's the assumption. And so this is an ordinary linear regression. X is a metric a variable. Um, and it's just, it's just a linear regression with some intercept, AX. Uh, and then we model the um, influence of this unobserved uh, group level variable, U for each G. And those are defined as just a vector there, right? I see we have a vector of length NG, which is the number of groups. And I assign each of those U values a normal 0, 1 prior. Yeah, since it's a latent variable, you can assign it almost any prior you like, yeah, because it, it has no metric that you can measure. And then there's a bunch of priors at the bottom, and those are standard. Uh, this seems weird, I know, but again, it's perfectly legitimate. Models like this are used all the time. This is basically a latent measurement error model. The idea is 
We have some measurements, the, each of the x sub i's, which gives it, give us information about the group mean for those x's, but we haven't observed the group mean, and so we're estimating it, and that group mean is u for each group g. Yeah, so really this is a, like a measurement error model. Yeah, so, oh, I should have highlighted this already. So you see, yes, there's uh, the u for each g appears in both of the equations, yeah, and it's in both of the decks. And we can estimate it. Uh, you'll see here now the latent Mudlack machine I've drawn in green. I, I appreciate that this is one of the uh, ugliest figures from the course so far, but don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll aspire to do something even worse in future lectures. But just focus on the green one for now, and you'll see that's the Mudlack machine. High density region is over the true effect for X and for Z. This is your best option by far if you've got the Bayesian horsepower to do it. All right, let me summarize. Should you use fixed effects? Yeah, I mean, sure. There are times when it's fine. I mean, if you're not if you don't if you're not interested in group level predictors and you're not interested in prediction, um, no problem. Yeah, go ahead and do it. Um, should you include uh, average x, that is the Munlach machine? Um, often that works fine. If you don't have the Bayesian horsepower, uh, it'll work quite well. It's better than ignoring the group level confounding for sure. But these days, you might as well do the latent model. Um, everybody's got the horsepower to do this, and you know if you know how to do it, go ahead and do it. Uh, I don't see any major obstacle anymore. Um, a decade ago, I might have said something different uh, because lots of people didn't have uh, convenient software to do these latent measurement error models. But now it's really standard in lots of fields, and, and I'd advise you just to do that. Uh, but in any case, there's other kinds of confounding, both at the individual level, time varying confounding, all kinds of stuff. And you shouldn't assume that any of the things I've showed you in this bonus round apply to all kinds of group level confounding. What you need to do is draw your assumptions, make a generative model, develop a solution if one is possible that way for your bespoke purpose. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.